Mike Buchanan surprised everyone, including himself, as he edged out other Republican candidates in New Hampshire's presidential primary. His message of a new conservatism struck a chord with voters here. We're going to give voice to the voiceless. We speak up for those who have no representative. We're going to go to Washington. We will be the lobbyists for those who don't have a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. Bob Dole was supposed to be the winner here. His second place showing is a disappointment. The race is now a fight between Dole and Buchanan for the heart and soul of the Republican Party. I believe in the Republican Party. I'll continue to fight for the Republican Party. And I want to be the majority party for the right reasons. I want America to win. Primary day began with Buchanan and Dole doing some last-minute campaigning over the airwaves. Dole chatted it up with talk show host Don Imus. You, along with our current president, uh, you didn't serve in Vietnam. I wonder if you could explain that to him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the reason I didn't, Strom, Strom Thurman was my recruiting officer. <laughs> And he thought I was too young to go. <laughs> well, Buchanan called into a number of radio shows from his hotel room. You don't understand these guys in Washington run around gushing on about free trade. The race was too close to call during the day, but as the night wore on, Buchanan started to pull ahead. And by 10 o'clock, all three major networks declared him the winner. But some political Four, analysts see this as a hollow victory for vote. Buchanan. If it had been one moderate against Buchanan the way it was with Bush and Buchanan four years ago, Buchanan wouldn't have had a chance. Even in victory, Buchanan sounded like a besieged candidate, calling on conservatives to help him in his presidential bid. Do not wait for orders from headquarters. Mount up, everybody, and ride to the sound of the guns. During his first presidential bid in 92, Pat Buchanan didn't win a single primary. But with his victory tonight here in New Hampshire, Buchanan hopes to have the momentum which will take him to the Republican convention in San Diego. Reporting from the Buchanan headquarters in Manchester, Gregory McQuay, WBZ News 4. Haven't we been through this before? Boston awoke this morning to find that Old Man Winter paid another visit, dumping half a foot of the white stuff we have come to know so well this winter. Plows worked through the night to keep the roads clear, but the sidewalks were another story. Drivers had to share the roads with the pedestrians who were out enjoying the winter wonderland. Are you sick of the snow? Oh, no, not at all. I think it's, it's good. We need that. We knew this was going to happen again. It was only a matter of time. Remember those balmy temperatures last week when the mercury soared to nearly 60 degrees? Well, forecasters are saying bundle up because we'll be lucky to get out of the teens this week. And the bitter cold temps has Mayor Thomas Menino concerned about the city's homeless and elderly. We're concerned about now is the cold weather that's coming in, uh, zero temperatures and uh, you know, no heat calls and uh, elderly. This morning's snow kept flights grounded at Logan Airport, but they were back in business just after 8 a.m. The storm dumped about six inches in the city of Boston which seems like a dusting one compared to the storms we got last month, which, by the way, was the snowiest January on record. But those records also show that February is the snowiest time of the year. And folks, we are only into the third day of the month. The snow did, however, catch a few people off guard who thought winter was giving us a break. Well, we had a little bit of a respite, but I guess, uh, I guess what, yesterday the Gulf of Sarah shadow, so now it's uh, six more weeks. Only six more weeks. Only six more weeks. All right. A long six weeks. <laughs> I think so. That old New England saying says if you don't like the weather, just wait a few minutes and then it will change. Well, with six weeks of winter left, that leaves room for a lot of changes. So don't put that shovel away just yet. In Boston, Gregory McQuay, WBZ News 4. So we are determined not to forget them, and we are determined always to honor them. Todd Owen has been to dozens of these ceremonies, but this year he is giving the keynote speech at the Veterans Day Parade in Orleans. May God bless America now and forever. Thank you. This 104-year-old veteran of World War I enlisted in the United States Tank Corps, but instead of fighting an enemy in a foreign land, he became an instructor at a camp in Pennsylvania. But our first camp was in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and my wife always said, don't tell anybody that you were at Gettysburg, they'll think you were in the Civil War. One would think that at 104 years of age, a person would begin to slow down. That's not the case for Todd Owen. 
In fact, he remains an active member of the local American Legion and was just reappointed its treasurer. I guess they know that I'm honest. And I'm awful slow now compared with what I used to be. When the war finally ended in 1918, Owen remembers huge victory celebrations in cities all across America. We, did, we couldn't do much celebrating. We were still really in the army, but there was great big celebrations in the cities and towns. I've heard about the telephone booths in New York that were occasionally at that time inhabited by enthusiastic young men and women. Fifty years may have passed since America's servicemen fought in the last World War, but the sacrifices made by all American veterans has not gone unnoticed by the young marchers in this parade. We might be out there someday fighting a war and we might have to make some sacrifices also and it's important to know what they had to, what sacrifices they had to make. Todd Owen and his fellow veterans went to war years ago to ensure the freedom of all Americans and so that kids like Matthew Robinson will hopefully never have to in the future. In Orleans, Gregory McQuaid, Cape 11 News. I'm satisfied that nine men didn't die in vain, or not that they died in vain, but they won't be forgotten. Carol Jamison has waited 23 years for the city of Boston to remember her husband. John Jamison was one of the nine firefighters killed in the infamous Hotel Vendome fire. No other fire in Boston's history has killed so many firefighters. The nine that were killed in 72, they knew them well. Fire Commissioner Martin Pierce battled the Vendome blaze and worked in the same engine company with five of the victims. Serving the city the way they did, the courage that was demonstrated uh, by them will serve as a symbol for all firefighters and for all people in the city. The memorial will include the names of the nine firefighters along with a bronzed helmet and fire coat. City officials hope to have the memorial completed before next June, the 24th anniversary of the fire. The 31-foot Black Granite Memorial will sit here, along Commonwealth Ave Mall, diagonally across the street from where the nine firefighters perished. It may have taken 23 years for this memorial to have been built, but for those whose lives were changed back on that day in 72, this memorial will serve as a constant reminder of the supreme sacrifice firefighters make. 23 years is a long time. It almost reminds me of how the Korean War veterans felt when they just got their memorial after such a long time. Maybe it'll mean more. In Boston, Gregory McQuaid, WBZ News 4. It was a year when Ted got his tunnel, O.J. Walk, and we said farewell to a woman named Rose. 1995 will soon be a memory, but before we begin 1996, we want to take one last look at the year in review. No, I'm going to be a full-time governor. You do not have to leave the state. About a third of the building has been blown away. And you can see just smoke and debris and fire on the ground, downtown on the ground. Uh, just devastating. I heard this loud blast, and it sounded like a bomb or something. I'll never forget what happened here today. I'm just glad that it's them. To see him running through the brush, it's not, it's not a scene that I'll soon forget. Lift off of the Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission that will herald a new day of international cooperation in space. U.S. astronaut Norm Staggard enters in. The roofs are off on the buildings uh, uh, alongside of us are uh, total devastation. Municipal police officers are not armed or equipped to stop a 58-ton tank. Today, whether you like it or not, God brought the idea through me. Seize this chance and make it work. The NATO military mission will be clear and limited, and there will be a reasonable timetable for their withdrawal.
first it sounded like a train humming, and uh, we knew we had to run for the basement. I was thinking of taking a bus to Copley. I said, I'll get there faster on the green line, faster to my grave. The overdoses, we believe, were the result of human error. Well, if it was a hit, it was a very sloppy hit in, in broad daylight inside a crowded restaurant. <laughs> was that over the top? What the hell were you thinking? <laughs> what a great job, and we want to say our 1995 year in review was produced and compiled by our librarian, Greg McQuaid, editors Bob Craig and Scott Erdman, and graphic designer Gary Stout. And uh, librarian Greg McQuaid has had that year in review look all day long. <laughs> so great a, job, though. A fascinating look at our world and snapshots on life. It was great. Super.